the motor vessel Balmoral, Britain's classic vintage coastal cruise ship, making one of only two journeys during 2013 when she was moved from her permanent berth in Bristol's floating harbour downstream for about half a mile to make way for the visiting boats at the annual harbour festival. Balmoral was ordered in October 1947 by Red Funnel of Southampton as a replacement for their paddle steamer of the same name. She was built at the Thornycroft Yard in Southampton and was launched on the 27th of June 1949. Just six weeks later she was fitted with two Newbury Ciron six-cylinder direct reversing two-stroke diesel engines. Balmoral's principal role in the Red Funnel fleet was to provide car and passenger ferry services between Southampton and Cowes on the Isle of Wight. She was designed to carry 12 cars on her rear deck, an area that was later used as a popular sun deck and which is now occupied by the dining saloon. She also carried out a wide range of scenic coastal excursions around the Isle of Wight during the summer months. In 1969, Balmoral was chartered from Red Funnel by P&A Campbell of the Bristol Channel. She was placed on a heavy programme of cruises and with her newly painted white funnel, Balmoral soon became a well-loved steamer as she cruised to Lundy and to other Bristol Channel resorts. Over the next 12 years, Balmoral became a great success in the Bristol Channel. Her speed, reliability and suitability for the channel had shown her potential. It was on Saturday the 2nd of June 1979, whilst exchanging berths at Ilfracombe, that the MV Balmoral met the paddle steamer Waverley for the first time. <laughs> Waverley had been purchased five years earlier by the paddle steamer Preservation Society for the sum of one pound. She was based on the River Clyde in Glasgow, but on this occasion she was making the first of many successful visits to the Bristol Channel. By 1980, with the collapse of the P&A Campbell Company, Balmoral faced an uncertain future. That is, until she was bought as a floating restaurant and disco in Dundee. However, this venture soon failed and Balmoral was again put up for sale. Waverley's success in the Bristol Channel between 1982 and 1985 had created a clear public demand for a Bristol Channel ship and the need for the paddle steamer to have a running mate to share her fixed costs persuaded the Waverley organisation to purchase Balmoral as her consort. In March 1985 Balmoral moved to Glasgow where an appeal was launched to raise the funds to restore an adapter and in January 1986 Balmoral entered the Govan shipyard where the old car deck was removed and the dining saloon we see today was installed. Balmoral entered service on the Bristol Channel again in 1986. She soon settled into a busy timetable operating popular cruises to Ilfracombe and Lundy from such places as Bristol, Penarth and Minehead. She also undertook a great number of special cruises to such places as Gloucester, Britain Ferry, Chepstow and Padstow. Balmoral has also taken part in many special events, such as the D-Day Royal Fleet Review and the Tower Bridge Centenary, both in 1994 
as well as offering special cruises to France and acting as the Isles of Scilly's ferry. Throughout these years, Balmoral has spent each winter in Bristol Harbour and has become an important reminder of the port's proud maritime heritage. By 2012, finances dictated that Waverley would have to operate alone, so the Balmoral was laid up in Bristol for the 2013 season, partly because of its heavy operating losses. Balmoral is just over 200 feet long and for the technically minded she's powered by two Grenner six-cylinder diesel engines driving twin propellers at a maximum speed of 16 knots. She is capable of carrying around 600 passengers. Throughout the two years that Balmoral had been laid up in Bristol's harbour a team of onboard volunteers has set work each Monday and Friday to undertake every kind of work, from simple but vital husbandry, like cleaning and painting, to more complex projects such as engineering work and accommodation refits. MV Balmoral is privileged to have such a dedicated support base in Bristol. The volunteers vary from former chief ships engineers to retired school teachers. The ship's engines are run at least once a month and are regularly inspected and tested by volunteer engineers Trevor Mussett and Hank Crowell. Undeterred by the laying up of the ship in 2013, the volunteers have continued to ensure that the woodwork aboard the ship is regularly varnished, brass polished and areas on board cleaned and tidied as required. The ship is being well cared for and regular maintenance continues to ensure that when called upon it will have all systems go for a return to service. In early 2013, Balmoral's owners, Waverley Steam Navigation, approached a number of members of the Paddle Steamer Preservation Society with a view to establishing a group to work up future plans for the Balmoral. It was initially hoped to undertake a limited sailing programme in 2013 and significant work went into developing this concept, but it was not to be. Subsequently, a new charitable company, the MV Balmoral Fund Limited, was established to lead the fundraising campaign and to finance dry docking refit and establish working capital for a new company dedicated to the operation of the ship. It was estimated that £350,000 would be needed to return the ship to full cruising operation and by April 2014 enough money had been raised to move the ship into dry dock and for a full survey and repair programme to be undertaken. Four thirty in the morning and the start of an epic voyage to discover what the future had in store for our favourite ship. 
She was on her way through Bristol's floating harbour, through Cumberland Basin Lock and down the River Avon to an overnight stop at Avonmouth Docks. Then, the following morning, she was to sail up the River Severn to the port of Sharpness and enter dry dock there for her much-awaited five-yearly overhaul. Note things are looking really good for Balmoral currently, yes. The Balmoral Fun. Fund's communications Thanks representative, Thanks Paul Doubler, takes up the story of the journey. I suppose there must have been doubts. After two years layup and the challenges faced with a complex voyage to dry docking in Sharpness, would everything work? Would there be any last minute complications? Tides, the weather, 101 things that could go against us. Well, it is with great pleasure and no little pride to be able to report that our ship really did us and indeed herself proud. She did everything asked of her and much, much more. Without missing a beat, she sailed quietly down the inner harbour while Bristol slept. Then through Cumberland Basin and out into the Avon. Under Brunel's famous Clifton Suspension Bridge, and a majestic sail down the river, looking quite magnificent. Serene herself, Balmoral seemed to be so happy, being underway and sailing again. She was letting out some smoke, but that could be expected after so long a period of inactivity and that old engine oil being disturbed. Once out into open water, it was decided to give the old girl a head and open up the engines. Down to Cleveland at some 15 knots, now with hardly a hint of any smoke. We passed Clevedon Pier, then turned and headed for docking at Avonmouth for her overnight stay. Another beautiful morning, running along well with the tide under both the seven bridges. Before we knew it, sharp nest lock gates were ahead. Rising up and down triumphantly through locks, and then the tricky maneuvering of getting her into a very tight dry dock. Finally, slowly settling her down safely onto the blocks. The pumps were turned on and a few hours later there she was, on the blocks and underneath her skirts exposed for all to see. Once in the dock, the ship became the responsibility of her agents, C-SPAN, whose task it was to steer her through all the tests and repairs, thereby gaining a seaworthy certificate from the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. Trevor Mussett, one of the Balmoral's volunteer engineers, has spent many years working in the ship and he now explains some of the work being undertaken by the team of shipyard workers. The first job on entering dry dock is to clean the vessel's hull down and to commence the ultrasonic survey, which measures the hull plate thickness. The areas to be tested are decided in agreement with the marine surveyor, but will cover all areas of the hull, 
The process will give a good indication of the overall condition of the hull and any areas which may need closer inspection. It is important that problems are highlighted at the earliest opportunity with not too many surprises later on in the dry dock. From this survey the work schedule for the whole steel work can be agreed with the main surveyor. This work will then bring the vessel to the required standard for certification. Here is a bow plate being cut for renewal. This plate has been damaged by contact with the anchor over the years. The removal of plates is much easier than the replacement as will be seen later. Care must be taken at this stage however that none of the surrounding structure is damaged in the process of burning out the old plate and that thought is given to the replacement procedure. Here the sacrificial alloys are being removed. As can be seen the anodes are badly pitted. This is as it should be, some degrading quicker than others depending on their position. The anodes are made of a metal alloy with a more active voltage than the steel hull. The difference in potential between the two metals means that the galvanic anode corrodes so that the anode material is consumed in preference to the steel hull. This is critical to ensure that little corrosion is taking place on the ship's hull. All the anodes will be renewed on this occasion and should last a number of years. After inspecting the hull following the initial clean down, a decision was made to give the hull a deeper clean as it was very rough from the paint build up. The high pressure water wash is sufficient to remove all old deposits of paint and general build up of deposits and leave the hull as smooth as its age permits. This gives a good base for the new paint to attach to and also gives a smooth hull which will give a better fuel consumption in the future. The bow plate removed earlier is now being replaced. The new plate has first to be measured and carefully cut to fit the required space. With the ship, very few plates are flat and therefore the plate has to be bent and shaped to fit. The gap to the existing plate work must be minimal or welding will be difficult. And all this with the plate hung up in mid-air. As welding commences, care is taken with the tack welding not to pull the plate out of position. And as the Balmoral is of riveted construction, care must also be taken not to overheat the structure or it could pull some of the rivets. Here we have the two new anchors, the old ones being condemned as life expired, the stocks being extremely worn in the way of the flukes after years of hard work. Areas of hull that were identified for replacement from the ultrasonic survey at the aft end of the vessel are cut out avoiding the main frames and riveted sections around it.
To remove the propeller shafts from the ship, they first have to be disconnected by splitting the coupling in the dark and cramped space of the aft bilge. Also a bit of an angle. That other one won't fit on there, will it? Yeah. Will it? The propeller shafts have to be removed for survey of the shaft bearings and replacement of the oil seals. The inner couplings having been split and the propellers removed, the removal of the shafts can commence. These shafts are some 30 feet long and 8 inch diameter so great care must has to be taken as the shafts are pulled out that they are not allowed to bend in any way. The lifting points have to be moved as the shaft is slowly pulled out maintaining it straight and level at all times. As the shaft is about to be pulled clear of the vessel, great care is required that it does not swing, suddenly causing damage. Once clear, inspection can start on all the component parts. Here the propeller is given a file inspection and polish. As with the hull, a clean and polished propeller without any blemishes cuts through the water better, gives less cavitation and therefore better fuel consumption, critical in these days of high fuel costs. Here are the new shiny anchors in place. These together with the cables are a critical safety feature of the ship. Once all the hull work is completed and tail shaft and rudders replaced, the whole painting can commence. A decision was made as the vessel would not be going to sea and be staying in fresh water this year that anti-fouling paint would not be used as it is extremely expensive. Instead, a coat of grey anti-corrosion paint was applied up to the waterline. This will protect the bare steel until next year. The final painting above the waterline is the icing on the cake for the ship. After spending over £100,000 for the dry rock work, this is the only area that shows up to the general public. That is except, of course, for the new shiny anchors. At 8am the sluices to the dry dock were opened and very slowly the water level rose. The Balmoral's communications man, Paul Doubler, continues his story. Under the direction of our C-SPAN engineer, Alan Booth, with our motorman and volunteer, Rob Skews, the two of them were down in the gunnels of the ship, ensuring all was well and that there were no leaks or faulty seals, etc. Then, all of a sudden, she was afloat. It was good news. All was well.
slowly, oh so slowly, under the command of Captain Roger Francis, we edged out of a tight dry dock and around into the lock. Once out into the River Severn, she was opened up, and looking more like a luxury yacht in the glorious sunshine, we quickly passed under the two Severn bridges. sailed majestically along the River Avon, but under increasingly threatening skies. All along the banks, people were out taking pictures and waving. As we got along to the portway, cars were tooting their horns and more and more people were coming out to see us and waving. Getting to Cumberland Basin, there were still hundreds of people waiting to see us come in. People were clapping and giving us the thumbs up. One gentleman even leaned over to me and put a £20 note in my hand and said, put it in the fund. We passed through the lock into the inner harbour and again slowly steamed up to our berth at Emshed. This time Bristol was alive on a very busy Sunday afternoon and the welcoming waves and cheers from the hundreds in harbourside pubs and bars were very welcome. We were all so proud of how magnificent she looked coming back as against when we had sailed out so early at 4.30am just a few short weeks before when she was looking really tired and rusted. It was a great day for our ship and the enormous number of people who love her. So let's take great pride and satisfaction on a job very well done and savour the moment. Then tomorrow, we start again, but with renewed pride, encouragement and optimism that yes, we can actually do this. As in the previous year, 
the water arena in front of the M shed needed to be set clear to accommodate the various water-based events planned to take place during the festival. First, the M shed's historic boats, the tugs John King and Mayflower, along with the fireboat Pyronaut, were moved. This year, Balmoral didn't have to move far, just down the quay about 300 yards. And with a gentle tug from the harbour master's boat, she was on her way. It was during this time, late July to mid-September, that the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency continued their inspection of the ship. And finally, on the 19th of September 2014, they were able to announce that the vessel had satisfactorily passed the tests on her hull, rudders, propeller, anchors and cables, and that according to their survey, her stability and machinery maintenance was in order. These special survey results will last for five years, allowing the ship to sail with the passenger numbers and trading limits that applied to her last operational existence at the end of the 2012 cruising season. This Class 3 certificate is also dependent on the annual surveys, some of which need a training crew being on board demonstrating safety and fire drills. Further positive news is the good progress of discussions with the ship's owners, the Waverley Steam Navigation, about purchasing Balmoral for a nominal sum. The price is likely to be the traditional one pound. If you walk around the festival today, plenty to see and do, whether it's on the water or around the different sites. Though it started overcast and showery, the festival weather finally turned out fine and the volunteers on the ship were delighted to give the 65-year-old vessel a bit of a party. <laughs> While there was much positive news to impart to their visitors, the team are under no illusions that probably the biggest challenge still faces them. It is estimated that at least £200,000 is still needed to prepare the ship for passenger service and more to set up a trading operation. So they were keen to take as many visitors as they could on tours around the ship. Early in the new year, the local member of parliament, Stephen Williams, visited the ship with some good news to impart. This is, this is Steve from my office. The purpose of his visit was to reveal a substantial grant to the ship from the Coastal Communities Fund, a government funded project. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please be seated? We're about to start. Well, and Bristol is actually getting uh, nearly one and a half million today. Um, you're getting uh, 344,000, um, which I'm sure you'll spend. Anyway, 344,000 to spend on refurbishing the ship. And Balmoral commenced her 2015 sailing season on Friday the 19th of June with an evening cruise from Bristol's Cumberland Basin down the River Avon accompanied by a folk singing group doing their stuff in the stern. A lot of water has flowed under the bridge since the awarding of the Coastal Communities Fund grant a couple of months earlier. A new marketing business, appropriately named White Funnel Limited, had been set up to run the day-to-day -day operations of a ship and to oversee the advertising and sale of tickets. 
the ship now had a captain who would command the ship for the rest of the season. His first task was to engage and train a crew, who would need to be tested in all aspects of the health and safety rules on the ship. At the same time, the final cruising schedule had been published and a new bookings website had opened at www.whitefunnel.co.uk. Once on board, the passenger will find that the ship caters for their every need. In the stern of the ship is the dining saloon. Here, hot meals and light snacks can be bought along with soft and alcoholic drinks. Drinks are also available at the bar in the Britannia Lounge in the forward part of the ship. And upstairs there is a smaller observation lounge giving fine views of the passing scenery. The souvenir shop is located just off the main deck. A large selection of goodies can be bought here from sweatshirts to pens and pencils and from Balmoral chocolates to our latest DVD called Sailing with the MV Balmoral. The main area of cruising for this her first season under the new ownership was the ever popular Bristol Channel. From the resort of Clevedon on the North Somerset coast, Balmoral took many successful cruises out to inspect the two small islands called Flatholm and Steepholm. From the West Somerset resort of Minehead, Balmoral offered cruises down the coast to Porlock Bay. And from the harbour at Ilfracombe, frequent sailings were available down the Atlantic coast towards Biddeford Bay. Regular trips were also taken to land and explore the unspoiled and magical island of Lundy, where the Bristol Channel turns into the mighty Atlantic Ocean. Penarth, just a few miles down the coast from Cardiff, was Balmoral's principal destination in South Wales during 2015. From the newly refurbished pier, short cruises were offered down the coast towards Barry. The Welsh seaside resort of Porth Call was also a popular stop, where passengers could either spend a few hours ashore or take a leisurely cruise along the Welsh heritage coast towards the lighthouse at Nash Point. Two short visits to Liverpool and the north coast of Wales were also undertaken, where passengers were able to enjoy a number of very successful cruises right round the island of Anglesey and up under the imposing bridges across the Menai Strait.
The owners of the ship, the Balmoral Fund Limited, believe that cruises like this historic south coast trip along part of Dorset's Jurassic Coast will ensure that the proud tradition of the United Kingdom's maritime heritage is preserved in the MV Balmoral as an educational example of one of the last working coastal excursion ships. As can be imagined, a historic ship of nearly 70 years of age is costly to maintain and there are never-ending lists of mechanical equipment that need renewal so that she will be able to continue sailing in future years. All this needs extra money. For details of ways you can help us, please ask the Balmoral representative. <laughs> It is believed that Balmoral is the largest ship ever to undertake this voyage right round the Isle of Sheppey. We would very much like to undertake the trip again in the future. Balmoral's 2017 season was far from being the success we had hoped for. Technical and logistic problems plagued her throughout the season and the dreadful summer weather led to more cancellations than we would have wanted. And then, just after Christmas, the organisation that controls health and safety standards on board shipping in this country introduced tough new rules regarding the operation of historic ships like the Balmoral. Unfortunately, as a result of these major rule changes, we are unable to sail Balmoral this summer. In order to ensure that the Balmoral is once again able to sail majestically past the many sites along the River Thames in forthcoming seasons, the owners of the ship, the Balmoral Fund Limited, have mounted a major fundraising initiative. If you are able to assist us with this appeal, please look at the charity's website for details. Many thanks in advance for your support.